Welcome to Core 2 of your supervisory training. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm your Dean of Graduate Research. In the second core, we have a very particular goal that we're going to enact. We're going to move from compliance to supervisory excellence. So we're moving from that white knuckle ride, just hanging on to the regulations, hanging on to the milestones, to understanding how to enable a supervisory relationship and enable excellence in doctoral research. So I've recorded this particular session, Core 2, in one part so that you gain a sense of the development, the trajectory of your supervisory career. We're going to be particularly working on the characteristics of a great supervisory relationship. Right now, Flinders has just under 1,200 PhD students. Uh, the overwhelming majority of our doctoral candidates are PhD students, but we do have a very special and wonderful slice of master's scholars, particularly in the sciences. Just under one quarter of our candidates are international scholars. And also please note that the professional doctorates, the prof docs, are also part of what we are discussing here. There is a specificity to the professional doctorate that we'll discuss in other elective professional developments, but particularly we need to acknowledge the portfolio and the increasing complexity of what we call doctoral research and also postgraduate education. Doctoral education, though, is everything to a university. Everything. I've often said, on the record and off the record, that if Australian universities get doctoral education wrong, if we dumb down doctoral education, we might as well close our universities down. It is everything. It is the qualification of the university. We are judged by its excellence, and we should be judged by its excellence. So they are important these PhDs, socially, culturally, intellectually and institutionally, they're also important financially. They're important for funding and this is quite significant that we talk about this right at the start in an upfront and transparent fashion. Part now of our research training scheme is the reward for completions, doctoral completions. There's always been a bit of reward at the end as part of the RTS for the completion. Right now, 50% of our funding via the RTS comes from the completion. So I'll state that again. Right now in Australia, 50% of the funding that we receive for doctoral education only comes at the end, at the completion. And that's why I really worry, worry about scholars, about supervisors in Australia and internationally that do not focus on the completion. When we start we must think about the ending. Start as we mean to continue, but start so that we can finish the candidature, full stop, but we can also finish the candidature in the minimum time. That is the gold standard, and that is the excellence that we're going to be talking about today. You see, anyone can supervise. Supervision is really easy, but very few can supervise to completion and even fewer can supervise to completion in the minimum time. And that's your aspiration. That's your excellence. Supervision is easy. It is. It's easy. Anyone can take the workload. Anyone can have a, a nice cup of coffee once a week with a bright and interesting PhD student. That's really pleasant. That's lovely. But supervision to completion is incredibly difficult. So I'd like us all to acknowledge that right at the start and acknowledge that a different series of skills are required to enable that doctoral completion. As you can see, I'm a bit worked up about this because these statements are coming from a woman who's had to pick up the pieces of poor doctoral supervision around the world for the last 20 years or so. So I've had to handle the cases where someone has supposedly supervised a PhD student for three, three and a half or four years and there is no chance of a completion. It is simply a shard, a series of shards that exist in the Word document. It is not a PhD. So I have to pick up the pieces and spend hundreds 
often thousands of hours over a very short series of months to try and get that student to the PhD completion. So it chews up all-nighters, it chews up weekends. I have to push the student absolutely to the extremities of what they can achieve to get the completion done. But completions don't only matter to an institution for funding and all the rest of it. They also matter to the student, obviously, because if we can get them through in three years, what's a year of your life worth? So that's incredibly attractive for the student as well. But completions also matter to your career. Promotions require success in completions in doctoral education. And every university in the world wants to hire a successful doctoral supervisor because it's incredibly attractive. They can market to the world that if a student comes and works with that supervisor, they will enact that completion in the minimum time and give them an outstanding experience. So it really matters to your career as well. And guys, particularly in Australia, but also in Europe, I would argue, there is increasing emphasis on research training. So yes, we need to complete our PhD students in the minimum time, but we also have to value add to that candidature. So ensuring an array of professional development experiences can be added to their CV throughout that. Now, I'm incredibly proud of Flinders and I'm incredibly proud of the Office of Graduate Research that we have what I believe is the finest PD scheme and system I've seen anywhere on the planet. So for your PhD students, we have an array of professional development portfolios and strategies and sessions that can slot, that can weave into their doctoral candidature as required. So that's great, but let's now talk about you. And let's talk about your supervisory methods. One of the big issues that makes me really crazy, and there aren't many issues now that make me crazy, I'm an incredibly old person, but this one still freaks me out. And it's the assumption that the experience of being a PhD student has something to do with creating excellence as a PhD supervisor. So that's a confusion between experience as a student and expertise as a supervisor. These are different things. And you'll see so often early career supervisors and indeed some late career supervisors as well endlessly returning to their experience of supervision. So when I was a PhD student, when I was a PhD student, when I was a PhD student. Now, I had a great blessing because I had a truly dreadful supervisory experience, both for my research masters and also for my PhD. And yes, it is a blessing because I can get absolutely no experience, no affirmation, no skills, no tools out of that supervisory experience. So I simply had to go, right, well, that was just dreadful, park it. And if I want to be an outstanding supervisor, I have to look at the andragogy, I have to look at the international research, international best practice, I have to look at the SOTL, the scholarship of teaching and learning in doctoral studies, and I have to work out through the research, through expertise, what a great supervisor is. So before we get into that, let's now take a moment and I will allow you to think about your experience as a PhD student. So your experience of being supervised. And think about what went well, Think about what went badly. What were the challenges? You may like to write that down. You may certainly like to log it. But then what I want you to do is transcend it. I want you to move beyond that individual experience of supervision. And also recognise we now live in a different time a different time for higher education. The changes that I've seen to higher education, not only in the last 20 years, or the last 10 years, or the last five years, the changes I have seen in the last two years in terms of what is research, what is impact, what is research training, what is international best practice, what is happening in our universities at the moment, the changes in the last two years have been astronomical. So you do have to question the transferability of those earlier skills and abilities and how they operate now. 
Therefore, I want us to start to develop the characteristics of successful supervision that is appropriate for you, your paradigm, your discipline, your career. Do you have a supervisory model or template? Where has that come from? And how appropriate is that model for now, for the complicated nature of working in universities right now? It is important, in fact it's probably the most important suggestion I'll give you in this session today, it is very important that you consider why you want to supervise. As I say so often, supervising a PhD student is a privilege. It's not a right, it's a privilege. So for me, the continuum of reasons why someone would like to supervise a PhD student move from profound selfishness to profound intellectual generosity. They're the poles, if you will, of the continuum. So are you supervising a PhD student because you get a lot out of it, personally, professionally, or are you supervising a PhD student because you are giving back to higher education? Most of us have a combination of those variables, but maybe start to position yourself on that continuum. It is important that you ask yourself, why are you supervising? Why do you want to supervise a PhD student? On the selfish end, and there's a lot of danger, Will Robinson, danger here, the supervisor is using the PhD student to enable their own research. So they're thinking in the next three or so years, they're going to be able to ride on the coattails of their PhD student's publications and suck them straight into their CV. Now, if that's you, it's, I think, quite important that you acknowledge that and just say, that's what I'm interested in. It's also important you tell the PhD student that. And you have a very early and robust conversation about IP, about authorship, and about ownership, so they know what they're getting into. Also, just a little bit of a, a caveat there. Uh, don't make assumptions that you have the right to add your name to a PhD student's article. By Australian research guidelines, there are very specific criteria by which you can add your name to a PhD student's publication. So if you haven't seen those guidelines, please send me an email and I'll send you the link. Also ask yourself, and this is the ethical question here guys, also ask yourself what sort of an academic are you if you want to leverage the work of your PhD students? So what sort of academic are you? And I'm being provocative there and I'm raising the ethical issue because I am trying to provoke you so that you think about what exactly am I getting into this for? What are my reasons? What are my rationales? What's my relationship with this student and with this candidature? There is a, an old football soccer, an old football chant. Who are ya? Who are ya? Who are ya? And in some ways, that's what I want you to think about during this session today. Who exactly are you as an academic? Who are you? as a PhD supervisor and what are you interested in in getting from this relationship so be honest about the characteristics in yourself and how you're going to bring those to your supervision and be honest with your students right at the start now I know I've been really staunch here but that's because I can't convey to you the horror stories that I've seen and the horror stories I've had to manage in the last 10, 15 years when a PhD supervisor has simply pulled, trawled, pinched the words of their students. The students have then lost control and authorship of their own words. And it's catastrophic for the student and some of them really never recover and their careers never recover. There are, of course, many much more positive reasons for you to supervise because it's a joy to work with brilliant people. Most of us decided to enter higher education because we loved working with the clever, the brilliant, the fabulous, the people that believe in excellence. And we all learn so much from our PhD students, those fresh ideas, those fresh insights. It is inspirational work. Supervision is also a way for those of us who have gained so much from higher education to pay back some of those debts that we owe. For most of us, particularly from my sort of background, I'm sure there's colleagues out there that are the same, 
Higher education has given me everything, everything. I came from a tough background, my parents didn't make it to university. I owe higher education a lot. And one of the ways I pay back that debt is through supervision. Sharing our expertise, sharing our skills, sharing our abilities with the next generation. So this is often configured as the apprenticeship model. Sometimes it's called the mentoring or mentorship model. But also there's another great reason that you may decide to supervise that I've only sort of realised in the last 10-15 years. And that is doctoral supervision, but particularly doctoral examination, builds a whole series of local, national and international links. It's it's amazing how many long-term friendships I've created by randomly sending an email to an international scholar asking them to be an examiner. I've never met them, don't know who they are, uh, don't know what they're doing, but they're great scholars and I've approached them to examine my PhD student and they've done it with great professionalism and ethics and a whole series of really positive relationships have been formed after that examination. So don't underestimate that. That's the great privilege of being an international scholar. So do make sure that your motivations for PhD supervision are sound, they're strong and they are overtly communicated. And the reason they have to be, guys, is because supervision is incredibly tough. Tough. It chews up your nights, it chews up your weekends, you're staring at the ceiling at 3 o'clock in the morning, worried about your doctoral candidates. And that's why we should, and we are now, going to talk about workload. What's increasingly happening, guys, in higher education is some areas, some disciplines, some subjects have a booming doctoral program and some areas perhaps have fewer students and would like more. So the question for us as a university is how we balance out those opportunities and we balance out those successes. So if you're interested in supervision, then firstly you've done the right thing, you've enacted supervisory training, so well done you, but what I'd also advise, and I'm very happy to leverage these conversations as well on behalf of the office and the dean, and what I really want to do is start to develop those conversations with senior colleagues throughout the university about younger scholars' desire to supervise and how we can enact and even out doctoral supervision. And one of the best ways to do that is to recognise interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity and the capacity to move between faculties and move between between schools to have fantastic, robust, really interesting intellectual conversations. I think we often forget, forget that the characteristic of a PhD is an original contribution to knowledge. And many of those original contributions to knowledge come from these fantastic interdisciplinary links. So let's start to work with our colleagues beyond schools, beyond faculties, and start to really lift up the interesting interdisciplinary work that we're going to do. It's also important, I think, for the entire university that if a student does contact you about prospective supervision, if you can't do that supervision, state that to the prospective candidate, but also send it on to your research higher degree coordinator in your school or in your faculty. Send it on to me as the Dean in the Office of Graduate Research. So it's important every individual student is respected and cared for, and also that we open out the portfolio of supervision to colleagues who might like that chance. Also, I would think about honours. Honours is an incredibly complicated issue in Australia at the moment. We do need to promote our honours programs to convince our students to help them to maybe take one more year to open out different possibilities and trajectories in their career. So honours matters and how we promote it really matters. So as a prospective supervisor, say a student has contacted you. So how are you going to assess their capacity for success? There's been a fascinating change, I think, during my professional career. When I started in universities, when I was in my early and mid-twenties, the whole point was to assess the candidate. So we were assessing the scholar's ability to achieve. In the last 10 years or so, it's also moved to assessing their perspective project as well. So before they enrol, assessing what project they may enact. That's a change. When I did my doctorate, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was simply asked to write one sentence on a form about 
what my sort of topic may sort of be. But these days, we ask students to move incredibly quickly from sort of the vibe, the area of the thesis, through to research questions, methods, theories, strategies, milestones, and in some ways we're almost asking them to do too much too quickly. Particularly with high theoretical theses, they're not going to be able to work with Homi Baba's third space in the first month of their candidature. So we have to also demonstrate great respect for their journey and we have to have judgment to know that where they are now can be improved to ensure a high quality completion in three years. So it is important at the start to assess the, the candidate's current skills and abilities and what they're going to need to gain in the next year two years, three years. And again, use our professional development program and portfolio to weave through that candidature. And I'm so happy to sit with you and we'll match your students' needs with our program to create bespoke and customised options for you and your candidates. It's my pleasure to do that and help you with that. Now, my first meeting with my PhD students is absolutely everything. My first meeting takes about two hours and I ask them before they arrive, the week before, to fill in a document that I've referred to as the PhD setup document. It's 15 pages in length and they go through and they answer a series of questions and start to structure out their lives and their research. So I believe this setup document that I give my students and we talk through in this long first meeting saves me between three and six months of a candidature. I know right at the start what's going well, what the challenges will be, the skill development we need to enact, and it saves me three or six months. So if you would like to see that document, I'm very happy to share it. I'm sure you'll come up with an even better one, but please feel free to use that as a model if it would help you. You'll come up with your own version. Uh, in some systems, this is called the student supervisor compact. It can often be described as a charter. All sorts of words are used. Basically, it's configuring the rules, if you will, of the supervisory relationship. I always say that the root cause of a PhD student leaving a program is that the student has assumptions and the supervisor has assumptions that they never express, they talk past each other for two years and the student simply leaves. So the key therefore is to pronounce and enact those assumptions, talk through the assumptions, make sure that the dialogue is sound. Successful supervisory relationships start to critique and unravel those assumptions and present the rules, the expectations that both parties can agree to and are happy with. The dream, guys, and I'm going to be asking you to complete this as your assignment at the end of this core too, is to write me 500 words that presents your supervisory philosophy. The dream is, guys, you're able to write your supervisory philosophy and then you are prepared to send that to your perspective and your current students. This is who I am, this is what I believe in, let's talk about it. So sharing that supervisory philosophy is so important for our students, it models good behaviour and it's also transparent. So now we're getting to the crunchy stuff really, asking you to move from compliance to excellence, asking you why you are interested in supervising. Now increasingly, and this is the compliance element of this discussion guys, increasingly every single meeting that you enact with students has to be logged in some form. Sometimes there's a pro forma, so you log the date, who was present at the meeting, what work arrived, how it was handled, what work is required. Okay, so that's the pro forma and that's fine. It is a meeting record of some form. It has value and its value is that it protects the supervisor in particular. I would digitise this a bit and I would make it a bit easier. I would use your Microsoft calendar, make sure that, for example, all my meetings, I have weekly meetings with my PhD students and they're put in my calendar for the entire year. And so what I do is just add a little bit of information to that calendar entry at the end of each meeting about what was discussed, who was there and the next experience. Also, of course, I'm a little bit different. I also construct sonic notes from each meeting. At the end of each meeting, I take the final five minutes and the student and my fellow supervisor 
construct a short podcast about what was talked about and what the future work will be. But obviously, I'm a, you know, formerly a media professor, so podcasts are part of what I do. Sonic note-taking is part of what I do. But you can easily have a whole series of strategies that suits you. But writing those few notes down can be useful because it agrees we've got a sense of what happened at that meeting and the next work that is required particularly if your associate supervisor is not present in the meeting and we'll have other PD about how you manage the associate supervisor principal supervisor relationship which can be amazing but can also create profound problems for the student if it's not handled well Similarly, we do have a responsibility, and again, this is on the compliance end of the spectrum, to ensure that Flinders is fulfilling the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research. Flinders also has a very strong and robust policy on research practice, as we must. But, you know, the principles of these types of policies and regulations are clear, that we construct a safe and an ethical environment for our students. They're supervised well, we comply with legislation, we comply with policy, but also we enact full and clear transparency in terms of commercial arrangements. That's very important right at the start. We do place attention on record keeping and data retention, and we do monitor the research that's conducted by our students. We also have to have strategies so we're engaging with our students in a compassionate and a clear fashion. All of us as academics, as supervisors, need to make sure we reach these types of standards. And of course there's the ethics clearances as well, and we're so lucky at Flinders that we have a range of really specialist, wonderful ethics committees, whether it's the animal welfare crew, the clinical research crew, fantastic, social and behavioural ethics, biosafety and the Oki health. So these guys and girls have incredible expertise, they're intellectually generous, so please do use their expertise to move you and move your student through the candidature. I think probably the greatest challenge when we try to think about the relationship between compliance and excellence in doctoral education is the record keeping bit. So when we as academics hear the phrase record keeping, we think forms, we think compliance, we think monitoring, we think surveillance. And you know, most of us when dinosaurs roamed the earth, just wanted to be left alone with our students, like, I'm fine, dude, nothing to see here, we're just supervising this, this is cool, just leave me alone. And I sort of get that, but what I need to say to you is that those days are long gone, long gone, and there are some legitimate reasons why those types of discussions and those types of experiences are gone, because Data retention and record keeping really does matter. What I would say to you is find the way to automate it and digitise it the best you can. But guys, you are going to need to demonstrate your supervisory practice. And let me give you a reason why you need to. So say a student comes into my office, and this is my office, say a student comes into my office and says, I have not seen my supervisor in six months. And I obviously have to investigate that. If you've got on your Microsoft calendar, here are the 40 meetings that have been held and this is what was discussed, I simply display that to the student. I say, well, here are the records of the meetings. So the meetings did take place. What would you really like to talk about? What's the issue that's particularly worrying you? So you cut down to what is really going on. So use digitisation as much as you can. Digital signatures, digital mobility of documents. Remember also to use the facilities that Flinders has that are available to you. It takes an entire university to complete a PhD student. So don't think you're this poor sole supervisor just flapping your wings and hoping for the best. All of us care for you, we will do anything for you, and my door is always open. So if you've got a vibe or an issue or anything you would like to discuss, I am here and my time is your time. My time is your time. I love seeing you have that conversation. And also our research services office provides great information. It's amazing actually about grants and funding and consultancy. Their website is amazing. And they also provide the link between us, the academics, and the senior managers. So that's incredibly important. You'll also find the most up-to-date version of Flinders University policy on research practice on their website. So let's now finish off this conversation where in some ways we began it. 
thinking about you as a supervisor, thinking about your PhD students and the research that you will create. Supervisory models are increasingly describing PhD students as trainee researchers. Trainee researchers. I have some issues with that, but that boat has long sailed. Uh, but I think my issue with it is there's a lot of compliance, I think, in that trainee model. We have to ensure that the students comply with policies and procedures, they work through their milestones, their annual review of progress, and ensure that their data sets and their methodologies are valid. And that's the compliance stuff. That's the baseline foundational work that we do in research. But really, it's the excellence and the excellence in supervision that I'm interested in, always and particularly today. And that comes from the supervisory relationship. Three years is a long time. Lives change in three years. Three and a half years ago, I was in a different country. So three years is a long time and stuff happens in people's lives. I often describe supervision as a dance between the supervisor and the student. And it is important to keep that dance together and in time, even if the rhythm changes. So make sure you have strategies about resolving conflict, resolving tensions, resolving challenges. And please, again, have a chat with me, have a chat with colleagues to help you in those difficult situations. What I would say to you is, if issues are coming, try and resolve them early. Don't let them fester. Most importantly, I think, for our students, we are modelling research integrity. The reason I think compliance is so important in doctoral education is because the cost of falsification, of fabrication and plagiarism is so incredibly great. And I also want to make a point about the communication between supervisors and students. I have seen emails from students to supervisors and from supervisors to students that will just freak you out, will make you hang your head in shame and immediately resign from a university that something as dreadful as that could occur. So what I would say is don't hide behind screens. If you wouldn't say it to their face, don't write it. And similarly, if you've got students that just are sending these terrible, weird things out to people, do stop them and explain intellectual integrity, intellectual generosity to them. And again, I'm very happy to have that chat if you need a third party to just work them through language and how that operates in terms of doctoral education. Also explain, and again, I'm happy to do this for our students, that supervisors are people. I think every now and again our students think we're a god or a guru, and so when we fall off that mantle, they get a bit rude, they get a bit nasty. So I always try and remind our students that we as supervisors are flesh and blood and bone. We have friends, we have families. So starting every conversation with kindness and decency and respect can make a real difference. So thank you so much for joining me for these first stages of Core 1 and Core 2. I'm going to see you very, very shortly for our workshop where we're going to walk these ideas around and see how they operate for you. So if you disagree with anything or just about everything I've said, that's great. I really welcome that commentary. I welcome that dialogue. I can't wait to see you actually. So I hope you're great. I hope you've got something out of these two cores. And the whole point is at Flinders, we're so lucky to work here. And our job is to create the best doctoral experience on the planet. That's my goal. The best doctoral program and the most outstanding doctoral candidates. So on behalf of the Office of Graduate Research, I thank you so much for your time and I'll see you soon. Every best wish to you.